great to be here at CCK. My name's Glenn, and hello to Hove and Racecourse and to Shoreham. Uh, great for you guys to be joining in with us as well. Uh, we've come to the end of a great series about the Reformation. Uh, 2017 is 500 years since Martin Luther banged up a list of 95 things he saw as wrong with the medieval church of his day. 500 years on, we remember that reformation. We remember that liberation that happened in history. And I guess the, the purpose of this series, Clarity, is to make sure that we not only understand the reformation that happened in history, but that we experience a reformation in our hearts. Should we just pray together as we come to God's word? Let's do that. Father, we thank you that uh, all through history, you have been liberating people, setting them free into the joy of Christ. And we pray that by the Spirit now, as we study your word together, you would again set us free. You would give us uh, that liberation, that joy, that confidence from, from seeing your Son, Jesus. Father, please may we see who you are in the face of Christ. Please may we see who we are in the face of Christ. Please may we see life rightly in the face of Christ. And we ask this so that we might be liberated, we might be set free to spread this good news here in Brighton. We might be set free to tell the world about our Savior, Christ alone. We pray in his name. Amen. As we begin, I just want to ask you three questions, and uh, I want you to answer silently uh, your gut responses to each of these three questions. The three questions are these. When you picture God, what do you think of? When you picture Jesus, what do you think of? And when God pictures you, what does he think of? What's your gut reaction to these three? I don't want your prettied up church response. I, I want your, your natural response. You're just your gut reaction to each of these three questions. Maybe if you take notes, maybe you could even jot down something. Maybe you could even draw something. I don't know. But as you think about what you picture when you think of God, what is it? When you picture what it is that when you think of Jesus, what, what is it? And when God pictures you, what does he think of? Well, as we look at uh, Colossians chapter 1, we're going to get God's Word to inform our guts. That's kind of what the Bible's been written for. The Bible's been written so that uh, every morning when you wake up and you're sluggish and you're grumpy and you don't, know your, you, know, you don't know what's what, and if you're anything like me, you imagine that, that yeah, maybe there's a God on the throne, but he's probably a monster, right? You wake up and you're, 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 just, you're not in the right place. Why do we open our scriptures? We open our scriptures so that our scriptures contradict our guts and tell us the truth. So Colossians chapter 1, if you've got a Bible, why don't you uh, turn to it or flick to it or tap on your screen or whatever it is, however you access the Bible, uh, or just read on the screen along. Colossians chapter 1, here's Paul preaching to a church, writing to them this letter, and he's going to answer our three questions for us. So Colossians chapter 1 from verse 15, Paul writes... The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and which, that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So there's Paul answering our three questions. Did you see some of the beginnings of Paul's answers to this, these questions? What do you picture when you think of God? What do you picture when you think of Jesus? What does God picture 
when he thinks of you. Let's just work through this. And as we work through this, I hope we'll see how Paul is continually preaching to us the beauty and the joy of Christ alone. As you think about how, who is God, as you think about your own Christian life, Paul will constantly be giving to us this reformational truth, this truth that has gripped the saints in all the ages. The truth that God's revelation is found in Christ alone. God's salvation is found in Christ alone. Let's begin with this first question. What do you picture when you think of God? I don't know what it is that you might have written down or you might have thought as you try to picture God. I've, I've got friends who say when, when they think of God, they, they just imagine this sort of comforting hand on their shoulder. Uh, I've got another friend who just thinks of a warm light. Uh, many people just think of a big man with a beard there up in the sky. I don't know what it is that you think of when you picture God. Uh, I imagine that if we sat down with you and everybody told us what their picture of God is, we, we might well have as many answers to that question as there are people here. And if you went out into Brighton, you asked people, what do you picture when you picture God? Again, I think you'd have as many answers as there are people who you ask. It's a difficult question. And verse 15 tells us why it's a difficult question. If you've got your Bible open there, why is it difficult to picture God? Why is it difficult to picture God? He's invisible. That's quite tricky, right? It's quite tricky to come up with who God is when he's invisible. And this is not just that God would be a difficult pictionary clue, okay? God would be a difficult pictionary clue if you imagine it. But in the Bible, not to be able to see God is not to know God. Those, those two things kind of go together. The fact that we don't see God is part and parcel of the fact that, as verse 21 puts it, we are alienated from God. We're not on speaking terms anymore. We're estranged from him. There's been a divorce we can't see God because we're not in relationship with God anymore. And that's a very serious thing. But it also means that nobody naturally knows what God is like. I used to, when I lived in London, go to Speaker's Corner quite a bit. Has anyone ever been to Speaker's Corner on a Sunday? Yeah, yeah, a few. And uh, it's, it's the northeast corner of Hyde Park. And uh, it's a real collecting place for nutters, you know, um, like me, basically. It's, it's, it's this kind of protected sphere for free speech. And for centuries, you've been able to go to Speaker's Corner and you can stand up on a soapbox. You have to stand up on a soapbox because you have to be six inches above the ground by royal decree. And when you're six inches off the ground, you can say whatever you like about whoever you like. It could be libelous, it could be a pack of lies, it could be... It could be blasphemous, it could be, it could be tyranny, well, you, could, you could be preaching anything. As long as you're six inches off the ground, you are beyond contradiction, and you can shoot your mouth off. And boy, do people shoot their mouths off at Speaker's Corner. And on a sunny Sunday, if you go down to Speaker's Corner, you will see every different worldview under the sun. And, and uh, you know, you might have uh, somebody standing up on a, on a soapbox and proclaiming, you know, look at the birds and the flowers and the trees. Look, look what Allah has done. And you literally walk down you know, 10 yards and there's somebody else standing up on a different soapbox. And they say, look at the birds and the flowers and the trees. Look, look what the God Ram has done. And you walk down this, and somebody says, look what Jehovah has done. And then you walk down and, and there's somebody with a bit of a personal hygiene problem and a bit of a facial tick saying, look, look what I did. Do you like it? Do you like it? And it, it's that kind of place, Speaker's Corner. I love it. I love it. It is that kind of place. And, and so... What's going on there? Because you've got all these different people looking at the same birds and the flowers and the trees, looking at the same creation, and they're all coming up with wildly different visions of who God is. You know what the problem is? God's invisible, and we are alienated from him. We are not very good listeners to the sermon of creation. None of us are. By nature, we just do not know God. So then, how are we meant to picture God? Because our first question is, if how would you picture God? And when you picture God, what do you think of? Well, I guess verse 15 gives us the right answer to that question, doesn't it? In order to picture God, what should we think of according to verse 15? Jesus, that's right. The Son is the image of the invisible God. Was that your gut reaction when I asked you? When you picture God, what do you think of? The Bible says there has been a picture given to us. There has been an image. It's Jesus. And in fact, the Bible goes further. The Bible says here in verse 15 that there is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is not just an image of God. He's not even just the best image of God. He's not just 
the seal of a series of improving images of God. He's the image of God. And without Jesus, God is otherwise invisible and unknowable. Now, how do you feel about that truth? This is the truth of Christ alone. The truth of Christ alone has really two major aspects to it. One major aspect is about revelation. We know God in Christ alone. The other major aspect is salvation. We are saved by Christ alone. And we'll look at those two different aspects as we go through this passage. But as we think about knowing God, this verse and so many others in the Bible are absolutely adamant. We don't know God unless we come to Christ. How do you feel about that? I think a lot of people hear that truth and they feel, that's a bit narrow, isn't it? A bit narrow. I mean, God, God is so much greater than little Jesus, right? Isn't that the way we usually think? We usually think God is this expansive figure and everybody knows what God's like, right? And Jesus, oh, who's, who can be sure about Jesus? I mean, maybe he was a prophet. Maybe he was the son of God. Maybe he was a good teacher. Maybe he was a guru. Maybe he was a legend. I don't know. I don't know about Jesus, but everyone knows about God, right? Isn't that how we generally think about God and Jesus? Everyone knows who God is. Even if you don't believe in God, you think you know what you don't believe in. Right? You think you know what God is like. Whereas Jesus, who's sure about him? Verse 15 absolutely turns that on its head. Okay? No, you don't know God. You absolutely don't know God. But Jesus, he's the image. He's the one who is on show. He's on display. He's in the public domain. He is the one who you can check out. So verse 15 is an absolute revolution that when we are to picture God, we are to think of Jesus. But maybe you still think that's narrow. Is it narrow to say that Jesus is the way to God? Well, this truth is only as narrow as Jesus is. Big question, is Jesus narrow? How narrow is the Son of God? Well, that brings us to our second question. When you picture Jesus, what do you think of? What do you picture when you think of Jesus? Do you just think of that Lovely teacher from 2,000 years ago who said some great things that we love to cross-stitch onto grandma's you know, mantelpiece. And, and is, is that who Jesus is? Well, hold on to your seats because verse 16 is about to go cosmic on us and paint a portrait of Jesus on a canvas that is greater than the universe. Verse 16, is this your picture of Jesus? For in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him. Is this your picture of Jesus? When you pictured Jesus, did you think of the creator of all things? The Bible says, go back before the universe. And you know what you find? You find Christ. The name Christ means anointed one. So instantly, as you hear the name Christ, you're being told about two other persons because Christ is being anointed by God the Father with God the Spirit. That's what Christ means. He is God the Son, anointed by God the Father with God the Spirit. But right back before the universe existed, Christ was there. And through him, all things have been made. I sometimes get the picture of, uh, of blowing bubbles. You know, when you, when you blow a bubble through a bubble ring, what happens? Well, the bubble ring shapes and defines the bubble. And Jesus, he's like the bubble ring of all creation, okay? The Father has kind of breathed his spirit through his Son. And just as the bubble ring shapes and defines the bubble, so Jesus Christ shapes and defines this world. All things have been made by Christ, through Christ. Which means this universe operates according to his personality, his characteristics, this is Jesus' universe, which means, you know, when, when your kids ask you questions like why, they love those why questions, don't they? You know, why is the sky blue? Why are hugs nice? Why do flowers smell great? And, and they keep asking why, but why, but why, but why, until you're just forced to say why, because it's bedtime, go, right? That's the end of the why questions, okay? But if you were to keep on asking why question after why question after why question after why question, you know what you get? At the end of all your why questions, you would get, because Jesus, 
because this is the universe that reflects his personality, his characteristic, because this universe is personally shaped by the Son of God. This really is Christ's universe. Have you had this bigger view of Jesus before? Have you thought about Jesus in these terms before? This is what the truth of Christ alone does. It it opens our mind. It expands our horizons to see who Jesus really is. He is the creator of all things, verse 16. And at the end of verse 16, it says, all things have been created through him and for him. That's brilliant, isn't it? The son of the father will inherit all things. That's what this is saying. That's why it calls him the firstborn in verse 15. It doesn't mean he's the first creature or anything. In the Bible, the word firstborn means he's the heir. He's inheriting all things, which means if you could somehow find the gift tag on this universe, you know what you'd see? You'd see the words from God the Father to God the Son. This is how much I love you. Okay, that's, that's what creation is. Creation is this love gift from the Father to the Son, which I think is extraordinary. But like when you go out and you see the beauty of the downs or you see a beautiful sunset, you see the stars at night, so often Christians kind of think, ah, doesn't that show us God's power? Yeah, yeah, it does. It does show us God's power. It takes a lot of power to create heaven and earth. It does. But even more than that, even deeper than that, you look at the beauty of this world and doesn't it demonstrate God's love? This is how much God loves. God loves so expansively. God loves so cosmically that in order to express his love for the Son, the Father had to create an entire universe. So who is Christ? He's the creator of all things. He's the heir of all things. Is he narrow? <laughs> We're saying that, you know, to know God, you must know Christ. Well, how, how cosmic is Christ? Christ is the creator of all things. He is the heir of all things. Verse 17, he is before all things. You know, if I just asked you cold before you came in, before you read these words, and if I just asked you, what was there before the universe? What would you have said? What was there before the universe? And you might, you might have started thinking about, you know, I don't know, there was probably nothing before the universe, right? The universe is everything, isn't it? Um, if you catch me off guard, I'm, I might start thinking in those terms, which is dreadful. That's, that's, not a, that's not a Christian way to think about things. As though the universe was everything? No, before all things, you know what there was. There was Christ together with his Father and the Spirit. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Again, if I was to ask you, what holds this universe together? Maybe if you're scientifically minded, you would start thinking of the weak and you know, strong nuclear forces and gravity and things like this. Well, no, no, those things describe the way Jesus holds this universe together. What is the deepest, most fundamental reality about this world? It is Christ. Is this how you think of Jesus? Is he narrow? He is cosmic. He is epic. And then I love verse 18. And he's the head of the body, the church. It's kind of like this this pinnacle. It's like this idea that Paul's saying, you know, Christ, he created heaven and earth. That's kind of cool. But the really cool thing is he's the head of us, (laughs) the church, the thing he really takes delight in. You know, it's, it's almost the idea of you know, Jesus looking at all his handiwork and he sees the horsehead nebula, he sees the Grand Canyon, and he says, yeah, they're nice, but I really love those guys, the church, my beloved. They are my body. And he is as closely connected to the church as a head is to a body. Think of how closely connected a head is to a body. You know, you know, if, if your head goes in one direction and your body goes in a different direction, you know, today has been a bad day for you, okay? <laughs> Heads and bodies go together, right? Okay? But what about this head? This head, what has he done? I love this. He's the head of the body, the church, so he's connected to us. We are connected to him as his body. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So what does this mean? It means the head has gone down into death gone down into that final enemy, the grave. And he's taken on that cosmic enemy of you and I. And he's defeated it. And he's conquered it. And he's punched a hole through the grave. And he's come out the other side. And as he has risen up to heaven, you know what? He's going to take us with him. Jesus is like the needle that goes through the black shroud of death and comes out the other side. 
But if you're connected to Christ by faith alone, you are like the thread and you're being pulled through that same trajectory, out through death and into feasting joy. Because we are connected to our head as a body is connected to its head. It's glorious. And because Jesus has taken on this great enemy, death, and because he has gained the victory over that great enemy, therefore in everything, verse 18, he has the supremacy. He has the preeminence. He has the first place. And then verse 19, you, you think Paul was, was done by now. You, you think he'd painted Christ in such cosmic pictures, you know, such a cosmic portrait of Christ. He can just sit down and, and, and just have a breather for a second, but he keeps going. He piles it on verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. How incredible. The entire universe has been made by him and for him and holds together in him and orbits around him and the fullness of deity dwells in him. <laughs> How narrow is Christ? <laughs> How small is... Yeah, do we just think about little Jesus, meek and mild? That's why the truth about Christ alone just sounds so narrow and it sounds so provincial. It sounds so parochial to say Jesus. Jesus is the way to go. That's so narrow. It's only as narrow as Jesus is. He's the creator of all things, the heir of all things. All things consist in him and the fullness of deity dwells in him. Okay, That's what we mean when we say Christ alone. We say he is the true Lord. He is the true Lord. All it means is we're saying Jesus is supreme. We're naming the true Lord of this world. The true Lord of this world is not Allah or Brahman or Buddha. It's Jesus. All those other realities exist within his universe. The true Lord of this world is not sex, money, or power. It's Jesus. All those other things exist within his universe. The true Lord of this world is, is not laws of nature, just grinding along with this certainty of the drum beats, right? That's not Lord. Laws of physics are not Lord. All those things exist within Jesus' universe. He is the creator of all things. He's the heir of all things. He's the mediator of all things. And the fullness of deity dwells in him. Now again, what do you think of when you think of the fullness of deity? It sounds like a very lofty phrase, doesn't it? The fullness of deity, the godness of God dwells in Jesus. What are you imagining as you imagine the godness of God? Well, what does Paul imagine when he imagines the godness of God shining out of Jesus at full strength? What is the supreme image of the godness of God shining at full strength? Imagine it. Imagine it now, the godness of God shining at full strength. What does it look like? Verse 20. And through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What does the fullness of deity look like in its most supreme revelation? What does it look like? It looks like a bleeding victim on the cross with his arms outstretched to the world, praying, Father, forgive them. That's what the godness of God looks like. Surprising, isn't it? This paragraph that begins with the Son is the image of the invisible God. He's the creator of all things. This paragraph that begins with the creator Christ ends up with Christ on the cross. And Paul says that's the pinnacle. That's the epitome of what the godness of God looks like. Jesus bleeding for his enemies. Now that is a God you can believe in. Don't you think? You know, we go out into the world and, and, and if you're a Christian, you say, I'm a Christian, and then you duck because you just think, ah, the world doesn't understand Christians and, and, and the world just kind of thinks that we are into this power play. The world thinks that we're just saying, look, there's a big man on the throne and you guys better bow, right? That's how the world thinks of the Christian message. Sometimes that's how Christians think of the Christian message which is horrific because that's not the Christian message. I go around the place preaching the Christian message to people who are not yet Christians. And one of the things I will commonly do is I'll just lay out my stall and I'll say to people, now, as I begin, when I say the name God, what I'm thinking of supremely is a bleeding sacrifice with his arms outstretched to the world, praying, Father, forgive. That's what I mean about God. I don't know what you mean when you think about God, but supremely, that's what I think of when I say the name God. And then we're in business. 
Because then we're preaching about a God the world might just believe in. I don't know about you, if you're a Christian here, I don't really warm to the idea that there might be some kind of God. I've never warmed to the idea of some kind of deity. I've never really gotten off on that. Some people, some people really love the idea that there might be some kind of deity. Somebody's looking down and smiling. Some people really warm to that idea. It's, yeah, me, not so much. I often describe myself, I'm, I'm a bit like the, the woman who throughout her life has always said, I do not believe in marriage. I do not believe in the institution of marriage. I'm dead against marriage. And then she meets Mr. Wright. And then she might even end up marrying the guy, right? Why does she end up marrying the guy? Because she now believes in marriage? No, because she believes in him and he's converted her. It's kind of the same way I feel about God. You know, it's, it's not that I'm generally, generally predisposed to the notion that there's some kind of deity. It's that Jesus has shown up. I've seen him with his arms wide open on the cross, bleeding for me, and I've thought, there's a God I can believe in. If that's what God's like, I'm in. Count me in. I'll jump in with both feet with, if that's what God's like. Lord Byron, the poet, he once said, if God is not like Jesus Christ, he ought to be. It's a great line, I think. And the truth of Christ alone says, good news, Byron, good news, okay? God is entirely and exactly all the way down to his bootstraps. He is Christ-like. When we talk about the truth of Christ alone, we are saying that the God who is there is the Christ-like God, and in him there is no unchrist-likeness at all. Martin Luther, 500 years ago, he had this great line. He says, There's no other, I have no other God but thee, born in a manger, died on a tree. That's the God that Luther was thinking about, the birth, the reformation. The God he's thinking about is the God who was born in a manger, the God who died on the tree. It's the Christ-like God. It's the Jesus God that we believe in. I use the word the, the Jesus God. I, I picked it up from a, a friend I met a couple of years ago. She was from Iran, and uh, she came and listened to some talks that I was giving at a university. And uh, she had all sorts of questions after the talk, and she was really getting into uh, this teaching from the Bible that I was bringing, and she, she's lapping it up. And I said, well, what's, what's your story? She said, well, I've, I've only just become a Christian. She said, I, I was in Iran, and I grew up as a very devout Muslim, and I'd learnt all the prayers in Arabic. I don't speak Arabic, but I learnt to say the prayers in Arabic. And I was, I was a really very devout, very pious Muslim. And then my uncle, he had become a Christian. And he managed to get to me a copy of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And my uncle said to me, you love Jesus, the prophet, right? Why don't you read about who he really is in the original source material? And this, this really appealed to her, the, the true story behind Jesus. She started reading these eyewitness accounts of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and halfway through Luke's Gospel. She said, I came to this conclusion. She said, God cannot be the God of the Ayatollahs. He has to be the Jesus God. And I've been using that phrase ever since. I think it's absolutely right. God cannot be the God of the religious authorities. Just that distant individual, high on power, low on personality. God cannot be that if he's worthy of the name. But then encounter him in the scriptures and see him suffering, stooping, serving, bleeding, and dying. Oh, he must be this God, right? Because when you see him on the cross, you know, there you are seeing him at full strength. Because if God is the source of all life, then how do we see God supremely? The place you see God supremely is where you see him pouring out his life, right? That's why the cross is the deepest revelation of what God is like. It's the deepest revelation because there you see the source of life pouring himself out. Now, friend, are you a Christian here? I don't know. I, I do not assume at all that everyone here signs on the dotted line and thinks of themselves as a Christian. Uh, maybe you're just curious about things. Could you get more than curious about this God? Here's a God who's gone to hell and back for you. I'm not trying to sell you on some kind of distant power that just wants you to bow. I'm telling you about one who has gone to hell and back for you. He's bled his own heart's blood for you, who loves you more than his own life. What do you reckon? Are you in? Are you in with this one? Forget the competition. What about Christ? What about Christ alone? Are you in? 
even now, just call out in your heart. Just say, Jesus, I'm in. This is what you're like. (laughs) I'm in. And if you're a Christian, don't take a message out to the world that is just, God is big, the world needs to bow. Take a message out to the world that is good news, the good news that God is the Christ-like God. Because all of us wake up in the morning and we imagine a monster on the throne. We just, just naturally, like our flesh is alienated from God, as verse 21 says. But by nature, our flesh is alienated from God and we, we think all sorts of ridiculous thoughts about God. Will you return again and again and again and again to Jesus and allow him to shape your knowledge of God? We know God in Christ alone. And then finally, we think about how we're saved by God in Christ alone. That's the final paragraph from verse 21. I wonder what you thought of when I asked that third question. Uh, when God pictures you, what does he picture? Right? That's a bit more personal, isn't it? Uh, what does God think about you after the week that you've had? How does God picture you after the last five years of wilderness wandering? How does God picture you when you've never given him the time of day? What is, how does God picture you? I think all of us naturally think in terms of a dimmer switch. Okay? We, we think of dimmer switch spirituality. You know, sometimes we're a bit gloomier. Sometimes we're a bit brighter. You know, today, we're in church on a Sunday. We are blazing at full strength. Go us! Yeah! We really got into the worship this Sunday, so God God is well pleased with us today. But then tomorrow we commit that sin that we always do. We fall back into it. And I guess we're a lot gloomier on Monday. But then on Tuesday, you know, we help three grannies across the road and, you know, crank up the godliness. And God is well pleased with us again on Tuesday. But then on Wednesday, we run over three grannies and it's it's just... (laughs) don't mean to, but it just keeps happening and back to the gloom and then we try and do something good and then we go and we just yo-yo in and out of God's presence. That's the natural way that we think of our spiritual life. We naturally think that we relate to God according to us and our performance. And if we think that, we have forgotten the truth of Christ alone. It's got nothing to do with this Reformation truth of Christ alone That kind of thinking is all about, you know, it's me. And my relationship with God is down to me. Or at least a little cooperation between me and Jesus, but mainly me. Okay, That's how we think in terms of dimmer switch spirituality. But Paul, in verses 21 and 22, he says, no, it's either an off switch or an on. It's either off or on. It's binary. One or the other. Okay? Verse 21 gives us the off position. He says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. That's very much off, isn't it? There's no life in the old girl there. You know, there's, there's not just a little bit of candlelight of flickering light there. It's off. It's just completely off. Three verdicts on the life of those who are outside of Christ. Alienated, enemies, evil. Wow. That's a serious thing, isn't it? How can Paul say this? Well, think about it. If everything in heaven and earth is for Christ, and you are not for Christ, what are you doing? If everything in the cosmos is oriented towards Jesus, and you are not oriented towards Jesus, what are you doing in the universe? You're going against the grain of all reality and you're going to get splinters. That's just the nature of the case. Makes sense, really. If this really is Christ's universe, then not to live with him is to live apart from the very basis of of, of being. It is to be very much in that off position. It's a fearful place to be. If you don't know Jesus, this is where you are right now, in that off position. But how does, how does Jesus feel about you in that off position? You know how he feels about you? He thinks you are to die for. He absolutely thinks you are to die for. And while you might not be for him, he is for you. 
And he has his arms outstretched to you. He loves you more than his own life. Can he win you? Can you say to him, Jesus, I want you? Jesus wants you. Can you say that to him? Jesus, I want you. Because the minute, the minute you come to Christ simply by faith alone, well, verse 22, it's the on position. Verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death, to present you his three different verdicts, holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. Wow. That is on. (laughs) That is as on as on gets, okay? There is no gloom in that. There's no dimmer switch in that. You are just on. You are as on as you can be in terms of spiritual life. Three verdicts. You are holy in God's sight. That means you're set apart as special, consecrated. You You are God's special stuff, okay? You are holy in God's sight. You are without blemish. You know, so often we feel stained in life. We do things and we just can't believe we've done them. We can't believe we've said them. There's there's a a sense of feeling dirty inside. Have you ever wanted a power shower on the inside? I've wondered that many, many times. That, That sense of wanting to be cleansed. You know what? In Christ, you are holy. You are without blemish spotless, pure in his sight. And you are free from accusation, free from accusation. Isn't it? Oh, that's wonderful, isn't it? In a world that is full of accusation, in a world that will condemn you in an instant. And if you're anything like me, you will condemn yourself in an instant. Wouldn't it be great to just be lifted out of the realm of accusation into this realm in which you are unblameable? Older translations of this verse spoke about being unblameable. You, it, is, it is impossible now for you to be blamed in any court that really matters. How does it happen? Well, it's the truth of being in Christ. When we were outside of Christ, we were against the very purposes of God. But when we are in Christ, now we are united to him as closely as a body is to a head. And the Father is anointing his head with the oil of the Spirit and pouring out every spiritual blessing on the head of Christ. And that spiritual blessing pours down to you. Now, if you are in Christ, you are loved as fiercely and as protectively as the Son of God. You are counted by God as a child, as an heir, as one of his special ones. And everything that is true of Jesus now becomes true of you if you are in Christ. None of this is about you. None of this is about you becoming a good boy or a good girl. All of it is about Christ and Christ alone. You have not contributed a calorie of effort to this salvation. It is all Jesus, only Jesus, Jesus alone. Which means you wake up tomorrow and you don't have to wonder how you're doing with God. You never have to wonder how you're doing with God ever again. You are doing as good as Christ is. And how's Christ doing? Pretty good last time I checked. Pretty good, yeah. If you are united to Christ, you know the only way you could ever go to hell is if Jesus goes. You are in Christ. And your spiritual life is not as good as your own performance. It's as good as Christ's performance. Does that give confidence? Does that give hope? Does that help you to walk out into your life with joy, with transformation, with liberation? Let me close with the story of John Bunyan. You might know John Bunyan as the author of Pilgrim's Progress, and uh, it's the second most read book in the English language after the Bible. Uh, John Bunyan wasn't always uh, uh, a joy-filled Christian. He spent so many years of his life with dimmer, d- d- dimmer switch Christianity, so much of his life wondering whether he'd done enough with God. But he narrates the story of how he came to this truth of Christ alone and how it absolutely set him free. He says this, One day as I was passing into the field, and that too with some dashes, with some stains on my conscience, fearing lest all was not right, this sentence fell upon my soul, thy righteousness is in heaven. And with the eyes of my soul, I saw Jesus at the Father's right hand. 
There, I said, is my righteousness. So that wherever I was or whatever I was doing, God could not say to me, where's your righteousness? For it is always right before him. I saw that it is not my good frame of heart that made my righteousness better, nor yet my bad frame that made my righteousness worse. For my righteousness is Christ. Now my chains fell off indeed, my temptations fled away, and I lived sweetly at peace with God. Now I could look from myself to him and could reckon that all my character was like the coins a rich man carries in his pocket when all his gold is safe in a trunk at home. Oh, I saw that my gold was indeed in a trunk at home, in Christ my Lord. Now Christ was all my righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. That's what happens when you understand the truth of Christ alone. It sets you free, gives you joy, gives you confidence to walk out into your day. So what do you picture when you think of God? Picture Jesus. What do you picture when you think of Jesus? Picture the cosmic creator and heir of all things bleeding for you. And when God pictures you, What does he think of? He thinks of his own beloved son. And you are righteous. You're delivered. You're adopted. You are eternally beloved in him, in Christ, in Christ alone. Let me pray for us. Father, there are people here who don't yet know the joy of being in Christ And I pray that even now as we have time before you, that they would just cry out and say, Jesus, I want you. Please be mine. I am yours. And for all of us, Father, we pray that we would look not to our own good thoughts to know what you are like, but look to Christ. May we look not to our own good deeds, but look to Christ and Christ alone. And through that, would you give us that liberation, that confidence, that joy and that hope. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.